Welcome in on a Wednesday, everybody. I'm Reed Cowan. All right, so two tickets and two strategies. Team Kamala Harris trying to keep that post DNC momentum, while at the same time, Team Donald Trump hits the road and hits Harris hard on the economy. Plus, Israel launches a major operation in the occupied West Bank. Militant groups targeted there. This is CBS News 24 7. Let's go. All right, but first and right off the top, let's get to the Middle East and those raids carried out by Israel Defense Forces. Violent surging in the occupied West Bank right now during the Gaza conflict. So let's bring in BBC News correspondent John Donison live right now in Ramallah in the Palestinian territories. John, what can you tell us about those operations in the West Bank? Well, this is the most extensive and widespread military operation in the West Bank, really for 20 years since the second Palestinian Intifada or uprising. Israel's forces carried out raids and strikes in four major Palestinian cities in the north of the West Bank, in Jenin, in Nablus, in Tulkarim and in Tubas. And this is ongoing at the moment. I was just looking at some pictures coming out of Jenin uh, in the last hour or so showing fierce gun battles ongoing uh, with Palestinian militants. Now, Israel has said this is a counter-terrorism operation. Israel's foreign minister, Israel Katz, said this was a war that had to be won. I think from the Palestinian point of view, they will see this as a major provo provocation and an escalation. And we just want to let our viewers know that you're hearing a little bit of a delay because it takes some time for my voice to get to where John is. But another big question, we know they've gone in, they've tore up roads, there are deaths to report here. Is there a concern that this could spread to a wider escalation there? There absolutely is. I mean, this is a region absolutely fraught with tension. We've got the war in Gaza that's been going on for more than 10 months now. We had this big flare up on Israel's northern border at the weekend with Israeli forces uh, exchanging fire with Hezbollah, the uh, Shia Iranian backed militant group in Lebanon. And I think you'll remember that the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, was in the region uh, last week. He was in Israel, and at that time he said it was important that all uh, parties in the region uh, stay away from what he called provocative actions. You know, his interest is trying to stop the war in Gaza spreading into a wider regional conflict. And certainly there will be many Palestinians and people in the Arab world who will see as what Israel has done today as a provocation. Night has fallen here now and it's going to be interesting to see what happens tonight in those northern uh, Palestinian cities because many people living there will be fearful that it could be another dangerous night. John, thank you so much for that live report and being with us on the stream today. You know, John talks tension internationally, now some tension here in the United States. The campaign trail in the Harris-Walls campaign, the Democrats' nominee for vice president, Governor Tim Wall, spoke to first responders in Boston at the International Association of Firefighters Convention. Watch. It's a privilege to be in front of this group, but I have to say it's also personal. Uh, the Minnesotans know this, and some of you in this room might know. Last year, we lost one of our bravest firefighting heroes, and I personally lost a dear friend. Chris Parsons was fire chief, fire captain from St. Paul. He worked closely with us um, and was president of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters. Chris was six foot seven, stood out in any crowd, but it's hard to imagine his personality was bigger than that six foot seven. He was the most generous and kind and funny individual that I had ever met. One conversation with that guy would make your entire day better. Tragically, we lost Chris in the line of duty. It's kind of heartbreak that no family and no community should have to endure because every hero deserves to come home at the end of every shift. And know this, we see your noble courage. We're forever grateful to you for going above and beyond to keep all of us safe. And we're committed to building a future that you and your families deserve. As Minnesota's governor, I was proud to bolster resources for firefighter training and education to invest in the equipment and the facilities to keep you safe, and to sign the most comprehensive fighter fighter well-being legislation in the nation. Wow. 
The resiliency to do this job is incredible. The physical toll it takes on your body, but the emotional toll and the time away from your family. We understand that, and putting the resources into it is absolutely critical. That's why I'm honored to be on a ticket with someone else who has long supported your essential work. As a native Californian, Vice President Harris knows explosive, dangerous, and unpredictable nature of wildfires in that state. She's been to the memorials, knows the depth of sacrifice that you and your families go through. In fact, it's a matter of family for her. The Vice President's brother-in-law, Andy Emhoff, spent his career as a firefighter in Santa Cruz, California, and retired as an IAFF member in good standing. And it As California Attorney General, and as Frank can attest, Kamala Harris sued the big banks for mismanaging your state's pension fund. And when she won, she returned hundreds of millions of dollars to firefighters and other public workers and to their families. So later today, Governor Walls and Vice President Kamala Harris will kick off a bus tour in the battleground state of Georgia. Our crews will be following that. So we want to show you this. It's video to our monitors that will command headlines all day long. It shows never-before-seen footage from the January 6th Capitol riot and then the fallout that happened days later, including a key moment when then-House Speaker Nancy Pelosi slammed Donald Trump. In fact, this footage is going to command a lot of conversations throughout the week. It was given to Congress by HBO and then obtained by CBS News. Watch. This all comes as Donald Trump faces a revised federal indictment related to allegations he tried to illegally interfere with the last election. CBS News campaign reporter and attorney Katrina Kaufman joins us live on the stream right now. Katrina, there are some changes to that approach here. Yes, what's really interesting is that special counsel Jack Smith went back to a new grand jury and got a superseding indictment for this D.C. election interference case. And it was right as he was bumping up against a deadline. They were supposed to have a joint filing on August 30th about how the original case was going to proceed. And what Smith has done with this new indictment is slimmed it down to make it in line with the Supreme Court's immunity ruling. And He's done a very interesting framework, which is instead of calling Donald Trump the president of the United States from the beginning of the indictment, he calls him a candidate for president who also lost that 2020 election. And that becomes the through line throughout mm -hmm. the indictment to take this out of the realm of official acts and into unofficial, which will pass muster under that Supreme Court immunity ruling. So throughout it, you see him talking about Trump taking actions related to the campaign as a candidate, as a private actor, um, personal actions. And he also removes one of the unnamed co-conspirators uh, who was affiliated with the Department of Justice. So anything related to the Department of Justice was also removed because the Supreme mm. Court made it clear that that would be considered official. So this is Jack Smith's effort to move this case forward again. Um, and I'd also like to point out that just on Monday, he also made an appeal to the 11th Circuit related to the Florida classified documents case. So we're seeing this renewed effort with both federal cases, even as we're running up against this election. So fascinating, reframing who Donald Trump was at that point in time. Katrina Kaufman, thank you so much. Important to look at that delineation there and get those details. We appreciate it. So meanwhile, we continue watching every move of both tickets for the presidency. Former President Donald Trump will hold rallies in, Mich in Michigan and Wisconsin. That's happening tomorrow. Meanwhile, Republican vice presidential candidate and nominee J.D. Vance will be in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's today, about 100 miles outside of Pittsburgh for a campaign event. Vance will then go to Wisconsin tonight. So we're watching all of that. And when we come back, people under a heat warning all across the United States. We have crews in many communities all throughout the state of Pennsylvania, and we'll be watching that. Coast to coast and streaming worldwide. You're watching CBS News 24-7. We'll watch the monitors until we come back in just a few minutes. Twenty-four seven coverage on news happening across the country right now. We go to Pittsburgh, where excessive heat forced several school districts to just shut down early for the day. Temperatures into the mid nineties there. At least thirty-seven public schools in that city did not have air conditioning to keep students school uh, students cool at school. Jess 
This is a problem all over the country. Schools shutting down a little bit early. Absolutely. Not only all over the country, but I want to specifically talk about areas like Cincinnati, stretching all the way over into New York, where they're not only dealing with this excessive heat, but they're also dealing with them, some thunderstorm activity as we head into the next couple hours and into the overnight hours tonight. Here's what it's looking like for us today. Upper 90s anywhere from Cincinnati over into Washington, D.C. Norfolk, a very similar trend, but keep in mind relative humidity is high over there, so you can add anywhere up to around 10 degrees on top of these numbers. That's the big reason why the National Weather Service has issued heat advisories and excessive heat warnings that will remain in effect throughout this afternoon today. And taking a look behind me, that excessive heat risk map is highlighting pretty much anywhere from Philadelphia, stretching all the way down along that east coastline. And we continue to keep a very close eye on this as we head into the coming days. So more on that right now, I would really like to bring in meteorologist Andrew Kozak, who's over in Philadelphia right now dealing with this heat. Andrew, how is this impacting local community members? Well, for one thing, Jessica, we're looking at a lot of kids being dismissed from school early, as you talked about. Uh, something over 60 public schools in the Philadelphia area don't have air conditioning. And because of that, the last couple of days, of course, today included, uh, they've been let out early. You know, the kids back to school, the backpacks, the extra clothes, the extra weight carrying around, that's a big concern for people when temperatures reach the middle 90s and it feels as hot as 105. And then on top of it, we've got to talk about the school athletes, those programs after school, playing football, playing baseball, really any physical activity got to be very careful not just for the sweating and the activity itself but also for the for the uh, ground and for what it actually heats up to with these temperatures so this doesn't feel at all like it's back to school it doesn't feel like it's back to school at all and you think about the parents you have to pack the extra water bottles for those kiddos you have to keep in mind of all those outdoor activities after school i have a question for you though in that area in philadelphia how often do you see heat like this especially during back to school season you know, we actually this year specifically had a really mild August up until this point. But statistically, this does happen, especially the last couple of years, more often than not. I will say this. We were supposed to be around 85 degrees the last couple of days before this little mini heat wave started. We were in the 70s and 80s. Average high this time of year, 85, compared to where we'll be today, 96 to 97, all within the next couple of hours. Record heat. Back in 1948 today, we were at 99 degrees, so we're going to get very close to the record, likely not hitting it. The good news, though, is that once we get past today, the cold front swings by, which, by the way, is going to give this area, the Delaware Valley, Philadelphia, and much of central southern New Jersey severe weather later on tonight. We're back into the 70s for highs tomorrow, and that leads us into a relatively mild start to the holiday weekend. Oh, that is good news, especially for that region. Cooler weather right around the corner. We just have to get through today first, so that means go back inside and, of course, drink lots of water. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Reed? All right, we've got some breaking news in Texas. We want to get to at least three people dead after a van rolled. This happened about 45 miles north of Fort Worth, Texas, in the community of Albert. CBS News Texas, Don White, live on the scene. Don, what can you tell us about what happened there? Well, good afternoon. I'm here along Route 287. This is in Wise County, Texas, about 30 miles or so south of the Oklahoma border. And a press conference with Texas Department of Safety just wrapped up about 15 minutes ago where we learned a lot of new information. The spokesperson tells us that the vehicle went off the roadway. The driver then overcorrected, and that is when the vehicle began to roll over. Let's take a look at some chopper video that we shot earlier today. The Wise County EMS chief says the single vehicle rollover crash happened just before 8 this morning. The injuries of the people who survived range from the walking wounded to those in critical condition. The Texas CPS spokesperson says only one of the 14 people inside the vehicle was wearing a seatbelt and that person was able to walk away from the situation. We have learned that 11 people were wounded. Three people are dead and one of the three people includes the driver. We were on the scene when some of the victims were being loaded into the helicopter and to us all of them appear to be adults. Wow. Our thoughts with everybody we know in stories like these, everybody that we mention there is somebody, somebody. Our thoughts with the people in the Lone Star State and specifically that community. Thank you so much for that update. More fallout continues for travelers who are going through Seattle Tacoma International Airport after an apparent cyber attack. It happened Saturday, disrupted internet, phones, and other systems at that airport. Well, the result for travelers going through, and you see those blank screens, passengers told just don't check your bags, 
if you want to avoid delays. Still no word, though, as to when those systems could be back up and running. Well, it seems like we tell you this often, and today is no exception. Plans to launch the SpaceX Polaris Dawn mission on hold yet again. This time, weather is to blame. And if you're keeping track, this is the second delay in just two days. That capsule carrying four private citizens featuring the first commercial spacewalk scheduled to lift off Friday. Not all is lost, though. After standing down from the Polaris launch, SpaceX shifted gears by launching this. It's the Starlink Internet satellites into space. That ended, though, when the booster toppled into the Atlantic Ocean, breaking apart, trying to land on a SpaceX drone ship. So this is some of that video from that event. SpaceX then scrubbed another Starlink mission. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about the people of Japan bracing for a typhoon. It's our understanding right here at CBS News 24-7. That typhoon is just now starting to hover over uh, one of the prefectures of Japan. We'll be back after the break. Our eyes on Russia and Ukraine at this hour. Russia firing missiles and drones across the border and into Ukraine. One hit President Volodymyr Zelensky's home city, another hit a hotel. And so you are looking a lot of rubble there at this hour. Those rescue crews going through that rubble using dogs to try to find survivors. In response, Ukraine hitting back. This video to our monitor shows a Russian oil depot on fire after taking a Ukrainian strike. Back here in the United States, our teams in New Jersey bringing us video as people say goodbye. One of Donald Trump's most vocal critics. We're talking about Congressman Bill Pascrell Jr. eulogized at a funeral today. Pascrell died last week at the age of 87. Let's jump the map to Las Vegas now. Jury deliberations in that murder trial against former politician Robert Tellis enter a third day. Tellis accused of killing an investigative reporter who wrote critical articles about him. Tellis, meanwhile, through his defense, claims he was framed. When a verdict is announced, and it could come at any minute, you will hear it right here on CBS News 24-7. We want to get to this video from our monitors showing an army of firefighters doing battle with a wildfire. This is not in the United States like we've seen for so many weeks here in the United States. This is Croatia's second largest city. More than 100 of those firefighters keeping the flames back as they got very close to houses, inching up those hillsides there. It's going to be a long day and a long night for them as the winds pick up there in Croatia. Meanwhile, in Japan, we understand one person died and several others injured as typhoon there dumps heavy rain on that region. The storm could make landfall, we understand, tomorrow, bringing strong winds and high surf there, but already they're seeing the effects. There are also increased worries about flooding and landslides. That part of the world, no stranger to typhoons, Jess. Typhoons, and we continue to keep a close eye on the tropics back here, too, impacting islands like Hawaii, for example, right around the corner. I'll have more on that coming up in a bit. I want to dive right back into what we had earlier. We were talking about the heat over in areas like D.C., stretching over into Philadelphia. And today, yes, we are dealing with record-breaking numbers in certain regions, anywhere from Ohio stretching over into New York. However, the other big weather story for us, taking a look behind me, has to do with some storms in that exact same area. Remember I talked about the relative humidity high in that region? We have a lot of activity as we head into the evening hours tonight, early morning hours tomorrow, anywhere from Indiana all the way over to Illinois, actually stretching slowly closer to West Virginia as we head into the coming days. These active storms cause a threat when it comes to severe weather, not only in that region with a slight to marginal risk, but there's damaging winds that are possible too. We also keep a close eye over in the Dakotas where large hail is a possibility anywhere from North Dakota all the way down into South Dakota throughout the afternoon hours today and evening hours tonight. Let's change gears real fast though we were just talking about the typhoons over closer to Japan well over into Hawaii we're no longer concerned about tropical storm Hone but we're keeping a close eye still on tropical storm Gilma as it slowly creeps towards the islands just north of it here's the good news though it's starting to lose strength it's decaying so what's going to end up happening is within the next couple days heading into this weekend's forecast it turns into a depression and then they're just left with some extra rain heading into this weekend's forecast and of course some really heavy winds too we'll have more on that coming up in just a bit for now over to you Reed. All right, thank you so much to Paris now, where we see and celebrate Paralympians competing in the 2024 Paralympic Games. Some of my favorite people. They kick off today. Security, we can tell you, is tied ahead of their opening ceremonies. More than 4,000 athletes showing all of us what is possible in this world as they compete in the Games. Now 
I'm very happy to stay here because it is my second open ceremony. I worked in Rio and now I'm very happy to stay here and good luck for everybody. Just a little bit of the excitement there and there's plenty to go around as opening ceremonies are set for today. Those games continue through Sunday. September 8th. Be sure to check it out. You believe inspired. Hey, when we come back, our crews continue following candidates in battleground states in the race to the White House. Georgia, a major prize. We're live where Georgia is on the mind of those who want to win when we come back. Welcome back, everybody. Okay, so we have our eyes on both tickets trying to win the White House. First of all, Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate, Governor Tim Walz, they're kicking off a bus tour in the battleground state of Georgia today. But first, Walz made a stop in Boston. He delivered remarks at the International Association of Firefighters Convention. Listen. When we're in office, we'll make sure you have all the resources and protections you need to do your jobs and your service is respected and that you come home safe every night. We know exactly who built this country. It's people like the folks in this room, firefighters, police officers, construction trades, teachers and nurses and veterans who contributed their contributions to our nations long after they got out of military service. It was you who built the middle class. And we know that when unions are strong, America's strong. Unions, definitely a hot property for both tickets. And it looks like the Harris Walls campaign are going for it big time. Let's bring in CBS News political reporter Aaron Navarro. He's live from Georgia, if you couldn't tell, from the trees swaying behind him in the breeze. Georgia, super important, Aaron, for both tickets, right? But while Team Trump hits Harris on the economy, how do you expect Walls to Georgia voters to respond today? Yeah, while Georgia is on the mind of both campaigns, Walls, as you noted, started speaking to a labor audience in Massachusetts. And he kind of hit back at some of the criticism from Trump and Vance, saying that Trump and Vance, quote, know about, know that working people is, is they, they just want to take advantage of them. And then he criticized Project 2025. That's the conservative blueprint the Harris campaign has been tying the Trump-Vance ticket to, said that Trump is uh, supportive of right to work and would harm uh, the ability to collectively bargain for these unions. But this is a crucial voting block for both campaigns, about 2.7 million labor union members in the battleground states. And you're seeing Walls not just talk to the firefighters union today, but as well as the AFSCME conference in Los Angeles earlier this month. Aaron, Republicans J.D. Vance has been super critical of the Harris Walls ticket for not taking direct questions from reporters. We're now learning of their first joint interview. What can you tell us about that? We know that it'll take place tomorrow and it'll be with CNN. It'll air tomorrow night. This is the first sit down for Vice President Harris as a presidential candidate. She will be joined by her running mate, Governor Tim Walls. And we know that Republicans have been criticizing them, saying that they should have been sitting down, taking questions sooner, uh, given just the truncated timeline that we have before the November election. A Democrat I talked to today here in Georgia said it does not really matter at this moment. It is after Labor Day when people will really tune in to hear the stances of these candidates and the timing for this interview line she does in these next couple months. Aaron, that scene behind you reminds me of that famous movie line, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. If you know, you know. Thank you so much, Aaron. We appreciate it. We're also tracking Republican VP nominee J.D. Vance. We were just speaking about he's speaking soon at a campaign event in Erie, Pennsylvania, about 100 miles outside of Pittsburgh. CBS News campaign reporter Libby Cathy joins us live now in Washington, D.C. Libby, what do you expect Vance to focus on in that very important state of Pennsylvania? That's right, Reed. Senator Vance is just about to land in Pennsylvania. He's going to Erie County. That is a battleground county, a boomerang county, rather, in a battleground state that has flip-flopped its support for Republicans and Democrats at the top of the ticket every presidential cycle for the past few decades. So J.D. Vance is going there to try to get uh, President Trump's working class message out to voters. He's expected to make a speech on the economy and energy. These are issues that the Trump campaign sees as weaknesses for Vice President Kamala Harris. So we'll be hitting on that today in Erie before traveling to other parts of the blue wall, a big focus for the Trump campaign read. That blue wall, really prime real estate. Okay, so Libby, we can clearly see both campaigns priority right now for these battleground states. Where is Vance off to after Pennsylvania? 
That's right. So after Pennsylvania, Vance is going tonight to Wisconsin, another one of those battleground states. He's going to a suburb that leans a little more conservative right outside of Green Bay. But he says this is just one of uh, many visits he'll be making this fall. This is actually his fourth visit to Wisconsin since obtaining the vice presidential nomination for Republicans and his fourth visit to Pennsylvania. And both of those visits come just before Trump is also going to be in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin later this week. So they are hitting the blue wall with their messages on the the economy, on energy, seeing these as weaknesses, and we'll keep tracking it, Reed. CBS News campaign reporter Libby Cathy, thank you so much. First time on the stream with us, you come back, okay? We'll hold you to it. Thank you, thank you. So, by the way, as J.D. Vance stumps for Trump, the former president is in Florida today. No events scheduled, but we are told he's going to hold rallies in Michigan and Wisconsin tomorrow. So the Trump camp has a lot to process this morning. First of all, word of renewed legal troubles in the form of a revised indictment. And now, newly released footage from January 6th. Skylar Henry reports from the White House. Less than 10 weeks before Election Day, former President Donald Trump faces a revised federal indictment, charging he engaged in a conspiracy to hold on to power and to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Special Counsel Jack Smith filed the slimmed down indictment to comply with the Supreme Court's July ruling that presidents have broad immunity for official acts. The new indictment removes the previous allegations concerning Trump's attempts to pressure the Justice Department into supporting his false claims that the election was rigged. Now, the allegations relate solely to the actions former President Trump took as a candidate, in other words, in his personal capacity. Trump has long claimed he did nothing wrong. This is a persecution of a political opponent. In social media posts, the former president responded to the revised indictment, accusing Smith of attempting to interfere with the November election. A day after the indictment comes never before released documentary footage from January 6th and the days after. The calling Some was recorded as then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was being evacuated from the Capitol. The footage was turned over to Congress by HBO and obtained by CBS News. It also includes Pelosi calling Trump a domestic enemy in the White House during a meeting with her staff. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Washington. Okay, so let's dig down a little bit more about that revised indictment against former President Donald Trump. A source close to Trump's legal team tells CBS News, quote, this was not a surprise. It doesn't change our position that we believe Smith's case is flawed. Close quote. Of course, talking about Jack Smith there. The source added that Trump's lawyers will soon ask for more time to brief that case. We'll be watching. You know, the former president's legal cases have the nation looking to the U.S. Supreme Court after their landmark decision on presidential immunity. In an exclusive interview, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson spoke with Nora O'Donnell for CBS Sunday Morning. She calls the court's ruling new and dangerous ground. Take a listen. In your dissent, you wrote that the court declared for the first time in history that the most powerful official in the United States can, under circumstances yet to be fully determined, become a law unto himself. It sounds like a warning. Well, I mean, that was my view of what the court determined. You were concerned about broad immunity. I was concerned about uh, a system that appeared to provide immunity for one individual under one set of circumstances, when we have a criminal justice system that had ordinarily treated everyone the same. Are you prepared that this election could end up before the Supreme Court? Uh, as prepared as anyone can be. <laughs> Let me ask you, are you prepared for all of the news cycles that, <laughs> that you're getting as a result of this election? Um, no. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think there are legal issues that arise out of the political process, and so the Supreme Court has to be prepared to respond uh, if, if that should be necessary. Historically rare for a Supreme Court justice to give an interview like this. You can watch Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson's full interview with Nora O'Donnell. That's on CBS Sunday morning. All right, look at this. Our monitors bringing you live pictures out of Philadelphia right now where a late summer scorcher has a lot of people on those streets and in those buildings on a high alert for excessive heat. 
if they have it, they are using air conditioning and they're cranking it up today, Jess. And a lot of schools in that area have actually done early dismissals because of that heat, too. And I mean, let's take a look at all the states. We're all dealing with hot temperatures. It's in the middle of summer for many of us with Las Vegas hitting 100. Well, it's middle of summer for all of us. Uh, Las Vegas, Phoenix, let's head over to California. We're all sitting in the triple digits, but it's regions anywhere from Ohio stretching all the way over into New York, where we're keeping a very close eye on right now. Reason being is the National Weather Service has issued excessive heat risks and warnings all throughout that region. And there's also air quality alerts. You see that in that gray color right there. So Memphis, for example, sitting at 99 degrees. We have upper 90s anywhere from D.C. all the way over into Norfolk. And the reason why I bring this up is because they're also dealing with high relative humidity. So that adds about another 5 to 10 degrees to these numbers. And this area is dealing with a lot of storm activity, too, as we head into the evening hours tonight. I'll have more on that coming up in a bit. Let's take a look at our heat risk map right behind me. Philadelphia, we were just talking to the meteorologist over there earlier, dealing with not record-breaking numbers, but close to record-breaking numbers. And there's about 20 cities all throughout this region that will break records heading into the evening hours tonight. And this heat stretches all the way down into Florida as well. So let's take a look at the Climate Prediction Center and what they have to say. Throughout the next 6 to 10 days, here's the good news. Relief is in sight right around the corner as early as tomorrow heading into this weekend's forecast. New York stretching down into Texas. There's going to be a huge development of low pressure that will actually cool that region off. So today is the extreme day. Tomorrow heading into the weekend, that's when we'll get a breath of fresh air all throughout the northeast. It does still stay above normal all the way down into the Florida area and stretching all the way down into the Keys region. We know you've got us covered, Jess. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Hey, when we come back, our Eye in America keeps us rooted in our promise to you. We are in your communities where you find solutions to issues that you face. Here's an issue. How to best teach the upcoming generation to read. We'll take you where they are trying to find some solutions and some new ways forward. When we come back. CBS News 24-7 keeping our promise to you when we see it, you see it in the form of breaking news. And this is news that could affect your travel plans in the weeks ahead. Listen up, flyers. United Airlines flight attendants have just voted to authorize a strike. This is a strike authorization vote. With that announcement live to nearly 20 picket lines at airports across the country. Workers demanding better pay, flexible schedules, and more. CBS News 24-7 watching travel impacts for you and your family in the days to come. Right now, let's take you overseas, our eyes on Russia and Ukraine at this very hour. Russia firing missiles and drones across the border into Ukraine, and this is the result. One, in fact, hit President Volodymyr Zelensky's home city. Another hit a hotel. So you see the search dogs there amidst the rubble. That's the work of crews trying to dig through that rubble to find survivors. Now, in response, Ukraine hitting Russia back. Look at that on the left side of your screen. And the fire and the flames there. That video to our monitor shows a Russian oil depot on fire after taking a Ukrainian drone strike. Back here in the United States, our team in New Jersey bringing us video as people say goodbye to one of Donald Trump's most vocal critics. We're talking about Congressman Bill Pascrell Jr. eulogized at a funeral mass today. Pascrell died last week at the age of 87. Let's go to Las Vegas now. We are starting to hear news out of Las Vegas that a verdict will soon be announced in the murder trial against Robert Tellis. Tellis is a former politician. He's accused of killing an investigative reporter who wrote critical articles about him. Again, we are understanding a verdict is to be read within the hour. Tellis claims, by the way, and has said all along, he was framed. Okay, so let's jump the map to Alaska. We want to follow up on a story we brought you yesterday on the stream. Recovery efforts continue in a place called Ketchikan after Sunday's massive landslide that killed one person and injured three others. It's just a mess there in that video. That slide damaged homes of piles of debris blocking roads. In fact, listen to Rochelle describing the moment she heard that slide hit her neighbor's house. I heard this huge rumble and I was like, what the heck was that? And then I went inside and my power kept flickering on and off, on and off. Well, the governor of Alaska has issued an emergency declaration as people heed those evacuation orders to get out because the ground is unstable, the soil there unstable, and they're just digging through right now. And also watching electricity, which is also out in many parts of Alaska. Let's go to Japan. One person killed, several others injured already as a typhoon starts to send heavy rain to that area. The storm could make landfall tomorrow, so we hear about those deaths. 
Just as we know, these are just the outer bands. High surf, strong winds expected to increase as that typhoon really sits on Japan. And there are increased worries right now about flooding and landslides. Jess, it's no wonder we only see one vehicle. It looks like an emergency vehicle out. Looks like people are staying inside. And those palm trees, you can see how windy it is already in that area too. I'll have more on the tropics in our region coming up in just a second. But let's head right back to the floor map real fast where I want to dive into areas like Illinois stretching over into Indiana, where not only are they dealing with excessive heat like we just mentioned only moments ago, but right behind me, we're also keeping a very close eye on thunderstorm activity that's going to stretch throughout that region heading into the evening hours tonight, early morning hours tomorrow. As we head into the coming days, you'll see it in just a second. There's a lot of thunderstorm activity that's going to stretch all the way over into New York, D.C. area, and this could cause a threat when it comes to hail, thunderstorm activity, and damaging winds, not necessarily tornadoes, but damaging winds into this region, especially just along the Appalachian. Now, heading into the coming days, our severe weather outlook still is in that slight to marginal risk stretching over there. And keep a close eye on the Dakotas, too. For our loved ones over there, they're under an enhanced risk right now for severe weather into the evening hours tonight with damaging winds potentially there as well. Those are the two big regions we're keeping a close eye on right now throughout the states. A small risk over into areas like Philadelphia right now for large hail, but an enhanced risk as we make our way all the way off into the Dakotas into the evening hours tonight. So as we change gears now over into one of our favorite states, of course, Hawaii, they just finished dealing with a tropical storm that swept to the south of them. That was this one right here. We kept a close eye on tropical storm Gilma, and we still are as we take a look at the track. It's just going to cusp north of those islands and bring in some heavy rain at times. Of course, that wind too, but this storm is decaying. It's turning into a tropical depression by the time it makes its way north of there, so the winds will die down. The sea surface temperatures are a lot cooler and that's the big reason why the storm doesn't have a lot of energy as it makes its way closer to Hawaii heading into this weekend read. All right, thank you so much. Hey, one of the things we do on the stream, in fact, it's our bread and butter is showing you video that comes to us right now. If it's happening right now, we are going to show it to you. You are looking at video coming to us out of Joint Base Andrews right now. That is going to take Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walls to the battleground state of Georgia. And they will be going to make their case to so many people in Georgia. In fact, she probably is getting off of that and getting on another plane that will be taking them to Georgia. And so we just know that this tees up what will be a visit by that ticket to appeal to voters there in that very crucial state. Uh, by the way, Harrison Walls will then go on a bus tour. So they will be exchanging plane tickets for bus tickets to appeal to voters in Georgia. But we saw that. We thought we would bring that to you today on the stream. Now this. Okay, CBS News, Eye on America keeps our dedication where it belongs solidly, right in your communities, where you live. You know, with students around the country returning to school, we're spending this week examining the state of education in the United States. One estimate has only about a third of elementary school students reading at grade level. That finding has a lot of schools rethinking how they teach kids how to read. CBS News correspondent Brooke Silverbraga takes us to New York into one of these classrooms learning to innovate. A safe A. A safe A. I pine I. I pine I. Oh, ho, oh. Oh, ho, oh. This is what a reading lesson now sounds like in a New York City first grade. Now I'm adding E to it. Melissa Jones Diaz going letter by letter teaching the mysterious code of the English language. It makes that letter O, that vowel, say its own name. Do kids really need to be explicitly taught all these rules? It makes the A say its own name. For decades, most schools said no. Give kids time with books they like, and they'll mostly figure it out themselves. Not now. Specific, detailed instruction is taking over. It was a big shift in my teaching and my understanding of how students learn to read. I did notice when I walk in, there's this decoding strategies poster up there. Was that poster yes. up here a year ago? No. This year now, that's more based upon the science of reading. The science of reading isn't so much a curriculum as a grassroots movement, best known for arguing that phonics, the relationship between letters and their sounds, is key to learning to read. It's powered by parents who believe the old system left their kids behind, and it's quickly transforming how reading is taught. 
39 states and the District of Columbia have passed new laws or made new rules requiring schools to follow the science of reading approach. That generally means new books and new teacher training with a focus on phonics. What we were doing was not working for a large number of our students, over half. Jason Borges is overseeing New York City's new reading program. After a partial rollout last year, it's in every classroom this fall. Last, okay, very good. And old approaches like letting kids look at the pictures to guess the word, so-called cueing, are being pushed to the past. So cueing is out. All right, teachers cannot do it anymore. They should not be doing it. Instead, when Brielle Rosario flips through Cinderella, the king's son was to give a ball. She's taught to ignore the pictures and focus on the letter groups. The class has spent hours drilling on. We learned the welded sounds. What is a welded sound? Like ONG song. Research is showing this method does help, but somewhat modestly. A recent Stanford study found two years of the approach was like getting an extra quarter year of learning. Implementing the changes can be hard, and knowing just how far to push those changes is still being sorted out. There has been obviously this giant swing across the country. We've seen it in state after state after state. I wonder how you think about the possibility of the pendulum swinging too far. It is a concern, particularly for me. It's not just about phonics, right? There's so much more to teaching reading that I worry that things will be not only too reductive, being just phonics, but then also that you know things do get taken a bit too far. The nation's largest school system is now attempting that balance. The test results will be eagerly awaited. So, Nate, good job. For I in America, Brooke Silva Braga in Brooklyn, New York. From cute kids to something else that's cute, meet five year old German short hair pointer Barney, voted as the TSA's cutest canine. So, if you fly through San Francisco International Airport, look out for this looker. They're natural hunting dogs, so um, they have high drive, and that's a big thing. Uh, working dogs have to have high drive to work. They want to come to work every day to find what they want to find, and they get their ball, and it's the best thing ever. That is handler Michelle there. She tells us Barney will be featured on the front cover, a cover dog, right, of TSA's canine calendar released in December. By the way, floor director Simon wants the country to know he thinks his dog is cuter. Competition's on. Thousands of people gathered once again for the annual La Tomatina Festival in Spain. Oh my goodness. This might look like a food fight, but it's actually a celebration. Uh, revelers hurl tomatoes, some even swimming in tomato sauce. It's all for fun, folks. Festivities began in 1945 when a fall sent a guy into a rage. He was mad he fell. He got up, started to swing fists at everything in his path, including vegetables. The crowd saw it. They joined in, pelted him with tomatoes, and it's been a messy tradition ever since. No Clorox getting that out. Okay, so we are watching news as it develops. That's what we do here on the stream, and we want to show you a live picture out of a Las Vegas courtroom. We continue watching for a verdict expected within the hour in the case of that former politician, Robert Tellis, accused of murdering a reporter in the Silver State. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same place.